The sutra that tells of the Buddha's last year begins with a very strange event. Ajatasattu, the king who has only recently become impressed with the Buddha, wants some advice. He's planning to attack the Vajans, which is a small republic on his border. And he wants some advice from the Buddha on how to do this. Of course, it shows how benighted the king is, thinking that the Buddha is the sort of person who would give advice on that area, especially advice on how to beat the Vajans. But he sends his minister, a Brahmin, and the Brahmin asks the Buddha, Will the king succeed? And the Buddha doesn't speak directly to the Brahmin. He turns to Ananda and talks about the qualities of the community and how they have a very strong sense of harmony within the community. And there's a message. They would not easily be defeated by a force of arms. The Brahmin takes that message home, and as we found out later, the king defeats the Bajans by sowing discord, and then he conquers the Republic without any bloodshed at all. Now, there are a lot of ways of reading this incident. One is that the Buddha didn't give political advice unless he was asked to, and even then it was very indirect. It was aimed mainly at minimizing the amount of killing that was going to go on. He didn't warn the Vajans of what was happening. He didn't get involved, really. His only involvement was to say, minimize the killing. And then within a year, he was gone. Which showed that the Buddha wasn't here to straighten out the world. If people wanted his opinion on how to conduct a society, he had a few stories that he would tell, but they were always placed in a mythic past or a mythic future, where kings abided by the laws, the laws were fair, and everybody was prosperous. That was his vision of the ideal society, where people lived in peace and they could practice. But he never tried to force his vision on anyone, and never tried to force his idea of justice, who was right and who was wrong. And his example of the ideal way of living, the most noble way of living, was to leave, to opt out. Because otherwise you're stuck in this continual back and forth that is becoming, further becoming. And this is what makes the, the Dhamma distinctive. You read every now and then people accusing meditation, especially as it's taught here in the West, of serving the interests of the status quo, telling people that their problems are inside, and if they learn how to straighten themselves out inside, then they can be more productive members of society. And the people who write these critiques are usually saying, well, they should, instead they should change society. We need a different social order. In other words, instead of having you be a servant to the status quo, they want you to be a servant to their ideas of what's right and wrong. But the Buddha's example is that we're not servants. And John Fuhrer would make this point many times. We're nobody's servant, he would say. Nobody hired us to be born, and nobody hired us to practice. Our decision to step out of further becoming is an assertion of our independence, and it's a noble act. In that last year, as the Buddha taught, going from place to place, one of the recurring themes was the Four Noble Dhammas, virtue, concentration, discernment, release. It's the release that makes these dhammas noble. But they're also noble in the sense that you're not harming anyone. You're not harming yourself. You're not harming the people around you. 
you're taking responsibility for your happiness. But you're not defining your happiness in terms of fitting in. And you see that to be truly happy, you've got to get out. And so as we meditate here, keep thinking that, keep that in mind. We're nobody's servant. And this is an act of independence. You're learning to be independent of your defilements, independent of any clinging to anything in the world. When you take the precepts, they're not taken with the idea, I'll do this only when it's convenient. I'll refrain from lying, say, only when it's convenient. Or refrain, refrain from killing only when it's convenient. You take, make it an absolute, I'm not going to kill, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to lie. Have illicit sex or take intoxicants under any circumstances. And the fact that we'll, this will create some inconvenient circumstances doesn't deter you. Same with concentration. You're sitting here and you have to, as the Buddha says, seclude yourself from sensuality. You could be sitting here for the hour thinking sensual thoughts and enjoying them, but you tell yourself no. And you stick with that decision. It's honorable and it's noble when you realize that there's a greater happiness that comes from abandoning the lesser happiness. And you're not going to try to find some grubbing way to combine the two. And the same with discernment. All three of these dhammas are dhammas of restraint. With discernment you realize there are certain desires you could give in to, but they're going to lead to suffering. And you find a way beyond those desires. And when the release comes, you found a happiness that doesn't have to depend on anything. Which means it doesn't have to feed on anyone. Remember the Buddha's question, what is one? He's, and the answer is not oneness of all being. It's all beings subsist on food. As long as you're a being, you have to feed. When release comes, you're freeing yourself from having to be a being. This doesn't mean annihilation. It means you're dropping a role that you took on, a role that required that you feed. And freed from that role, you're placing no burdens on anyone. And it is absolute freedom in lots of different ways. So we're doing this not to serve anyone's interest, either the interest of the status quo or the interest of the people who see the problems with the status quo. We're serving our own true interests. This is another example on how the Buddha's teaching is the middle way that steps outside of the either-or that so many people in society present us with. By framing the issue in a totally new way, the Buddha's question is, do you want to be free? That's the example he gives. He left a world in which there was going to be warfare, in which there was going to be birth, aging, illness, and death. Lots of injustice. There were the injustices of the, 
the monarchies, the injustices of just any system is going to have injustices. And it is part of generosity to help alleviate some of those situations. But that's not our purpose for being here. That's not the purpose in our generosity. We're trying to develop good qualities of mind. We're leaving behind good things as we leave the world. It's not the case that we leave everyone in a lurch. Look at the Buddha. He left behind lots of good examples and enabled a lot of people to follow his example by showing them the way. That's why his Bhārdhi Nibbāna was such a radical statement. This is the way to find true peace, and it's a way that's open to everybody. We have the good fortune of having found the path. So remember that the triple training doesn't end just with the development of discernment. It moves on to noble release. where you're free from servitude of all kinds. That's a gift to yourself and to everyone else. <laughs>